Hi, I'm Will Jarvis. And I'm Will's dad. We both love and are fascinated by stories. Stories about people. Stories about places. And stories about events. Our stories give shape and form to life. They give texture, color, and rhythm to the blank canvas that every new day presents to us. And they do that by informing us of our past as a directional marker for our future. Okay, Will, it's narrative time. Tell me a story. So welcome to Narratives. This is Will's dad, and we're here today in, on the crystal coast of North Carolina and Beaufort, North Carolina. And today we have a Nona Janarian Luthier who makes violins, and his name is Bobby Talton. And I have a special connection to Bobby Talton. He is my mother's brother. My mother had six brothers, uh, no sisters, so there were seven of them. This is her next oldest brother. And so today I should, well, unpack a little bit. I should uh, describe what a nonagenarian is, and that means you're between 90 and 100 years old. So that's that part. And then um, what about the luthier part? You're a luthier, Uncle Bobby. Well, violin maker, cello, and uh, not everything, but uh, concentrated on uh, violins, cellos, and I built, uh, oh, yeah, uh, other instruments, too. But these were just here and there. There was the banjo, the guitars, and a uh, few dulcimers. So violin makers probably prefer the term violin maker over luthier, which means string instrument, right? Uh, yes, that's, that's correct. Okay, uh, good. A great start. Um so what we're going to talk about, Will, Faith, and Glenn had an episode a few weeks ago, and they talked about education in depth. And I thought it would be uh, enlightening if we talked to an artist about education and where the artist got his education. And you didn't go to Harvard to learn violin making. Is that right, Uncle Bobby? Uh, no. Basically, I went to the basement in my woodworking shop and uh, started butchering up some wood. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great way to look at it. And, and, and speaking to you, it really, a lot of what, where you started in your artistry of instrument making, violin making specifically today, uh, was by building a house. Yeah, Betty Jane and I were, were chasing the prices of uh, houses and our savings could match the uh, increase in the price of houses from one year to the next. So we went out and bought a piece of woods, a lot of pine trees, a dirt road, and we started building our house. Now that, uh, I would have a very difficult time, except I have been around you and some people that have built houses, knowing how to build a house. So how did you start to build a house? Uh, I've started many things. You just uh, buy a piece of land and talk to people. They tell you it can't be done, but you go out and buy the land and then you go down and cut some trees and when the trees are cut down you go talk to a man with a bulldozer uh, and uh, get him to come out pile the stumps up you burn them then then he uh, pile those stumps and he also had a blade on his dozer and he scraped out a huge shallow hole not it, it, it was uh, it, he had to do it with a bulldozer because we had a pretty deep basement and uh, then after that he came out and left the bulldozer there and they burned all the stumps and then we that was it so what I'm hearing is what sort of spurred this creative artistic endeavor you have is first of all necessity you needed a place to live for the family to live and won't. And you, won't. Won't. And right. you're young, and you think you can do anything. You're invincible. 
And a lot, and a lot of that's probably true when you're <laughs> twenty or maybe late twenties and and start these things. Yeah, and the other thing, you kind of like the lady you're living with, you've been hanging around with a long time, and she. Th- <laughs> She thinks you can do anything, and you're not not quite sure, but you're going to do it anyway. So you have to show her that you, you have, you have to kind of get a little help from her. In fact, you have to get a lot of help from her. So you got you had great motivation. And in addition to that, you didn't. I mean, we've talked about this. You couldn't go Google how to build a house. You had to network. You had to ask around, talk to people, meet people find out what people's skills and talents were to figure out how to help you. Um, Also, uh, at that time, they had drawing boards. I spent a lot of time on the drawing board. And so if you own a drawing board, you call a blueprint. We call it drawings. So you get a drawing on a house, and then it doesn't tell you how to build it, but it shows how it goes together. So when you know how it goes together, if you keep working at it, you can figure out how to put it together. So a lot of that had to do with the kind of work you did where you... Uh, yes, absolutely. So that yes. gave you a, a good background to sort of leap off from. And one of the things that you've told me is that your father-in-law, Mr. Crossman, he cut every single piece of wood in that house with a handsaw. Uh, two handsaws. One was for a cross cut. And the other one is a rip saw, sharp as razors. We had two saw horses, and I would mark, and he would cut. And in, while he was cutting, I would nail. And that's there was no plywood at that time. We just used mostly one by six pine boards for sheathing, and for uh, uh, yeah, sheathing and and the subflooring. So, and you and Mr. Crossman were both working regular jobs during the day. Is that correct? Yeah, but he got off, uh, I got off a half hour earlier than he did. And he was working then, and his office is where the Vietnam Memorial is now. It was uh, kind of a temporary building. It had been there for about 50, 75 years. And uh, so I would pick him up jump in the car, stop, get fast food, go out, start sawing, nailing. Because we always, when we finished, and I think this is pretty important and to me, has been, uh, not recommending anybody else to it, but when we left every night, we put out the materials that we were going to be working on the next day. So we didn't have to waste a lot of time standing around saying, what are we going to do? So you got to maximize your time and, and distance, whatever. So, so Mr. Crossman, what, what age was he then? Was he in his 40s, 50s? Oh, no, no. He was probably uh, very close to retirement. He's close to 60. And, uh, but he was wiry, small, active, and uh, also uh, he was a— uh, a shipwright uh, went through apprentice school, so he know, knew how and lived in a family that they all worked at the shipyard in, up north. They, they were Yankees, Boston. But at any rate, he knew how things went together, how door locks worked, windows went in and everything. He was a great help, and he never questioned me. He just let me take the lead, and then sometimes I would ask him, because I found that after a while, it was smart to ask him, and then he would tell me. And very, how, very Bostonian. How how old were you when you started building the house? Um, I would have been uh, about 26. Okay. So, and so... 26, 27, like that. You and Mr. Crossman... There were there were parts where special uh, skills might have like you had an electrician come in to, not to pull the wiring but to connect the wiring some of the wiring up. You had some things like that where you had some specialized help. Is that right? Uh, the way we uh, I got some help uh, because these were office workers, but uh, with respect to the electrical system, uh, there was a. a fellow who had been a submariner on World War One, 
and he, you know, submarines, he was an electrician. So he said, I'm not pulling wires, but if you'll pull the wires, I'll come out and tie them in for you. So good old Herm Shewitt. Sure. Uh, Herm came out and brought his dikes, he called them, the heavy pliers, and he wired up my house. And then he complained because I use number 12 wire, which was very heavy wiring. The house was wired up like a naval ship. So you had an electrician, someone that had electrical background to help. You had a mason come, and you learned some from him, and he did. How did that work? Well, at that time, uh, you could get a handbook, and wiring was fairly simple. We used fuses, so uh, I, I put in the fuse epox, I, and I'd worked at, remember, I'd worked at Western Electric for a year uh, doing semi-complex electrical work, so I was used to drawings, you call them blueprints, but drawings, schematics, and um uh, Wiring was pretty simple. So and it took you a, you about a year to build this house. Is that correct? Yeah, pretty close to a year. Pretty close to a year. So you build a house, and then then you had an interest. And Mr. Crossman was a big one for sailing as well. Is that right? Mr. Crossman was you and Mr. Crossman had interest in sailing. Oh, absolutely. And the house wasn't finished completely. There were we kept. Working on the house, uh, uh, grading. The grading was done, but there were things to build. But since it was a home-built house, we moved in, and we still had a couple of months of work. And yeah, back to the sailing. That was he was the epitome of a true sailor. And that, and he was from Boston, which would be a big. Yeah, he grew up on the water, and he knew fish, and he knew sailboats. And he had never, I don't think, read a book, anything. But when he got on a boat, you didn't have to worry about it. People automatically ask him, would you like to take the wheel? And I'm talking about a good size sailboat. That happened a number of times, and I was always amazed that people would look at him and not at me and <laughs> say, will you take the wheel? <laughs> and so... Pretty soon, the house is finished, and then the next project is a sailboat. You build a sailboat, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, we, uh, we we had some leftover stuff, and he and I used to take his lovely daughter, my wife, and her mother, and we would take them into town to spend some money, and we would stay in the car, and we would head to Annapolis and go to the... Uh, I forgot what the uh, boat yard was at, but that was uh, Trumpy, I think, the famous wood boats. And we'd go out and see what the leftovers were for the uh, from the week's work. And they would, would he and I would uh, pick up some of that beautiful mahogany, the cutoffs, stick them in the trunk, stop by and get a bushel of steamed crabs, and head back and pick up his wife and my wife. And we'd go eat crabs and talk sailboats. Did you? Did Mr. Crossman help you with the sailboat as well? Did he work on the sailboat? Did Mr. Crossman work on help you build the sailboat? Absolutely, as well? um, uh, because he 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 and his I think it was ten and his family, and he had the uh, uh, a boat built by the Duponts and a bar on it for the races of nineteen twelve. And when they went out, all the boys worked in the shipyard, but the two of them that had the highest crafts in the apprentice school was the uh, uh, pattern maker and and the shipwright, which was uh, Frank, uh, my father-in-law. And so he's, when they would go out, everybody would pull off a hatch or a piece of the rail, and they would scrape sand while they were sailing they would, and then when they got back, they would varnish it. So the reason they had the boat was the, I think the Duponts and the bar owner wanted somebody to have the boat. They would take care of it. So uh, it was a fine sailboat, 50 some feet uh, overall on about 26 feet on the water line. It was gaff rig, and uh, it was the second sailboat that ever had the uh, wine glass uh, keel. 
It was built for the races of 1912, by the way. Wow. So um, the the sailboat that you built that I remember and I was on was a cat boat. Is that correct? Uh, Cape Cod Cat, yes, by Charlie Woodholtz. I worked with him. What he is was, a cat boat? Uh, I don't know, but a cat boat is a single mast, and it was, it was more or less like the uh, Sharpers are in North Carolina, but it was a uh, uh, north northeastern boat, uh, big around uh, Boston Harbor, and originally it it, it, it was uh, you could take the beam and double it and get the length. You know, to put it another way, if the boat was eight feet wide, the length of the hull would be sixteen feet. So it was like a, as Frank used to say, you can hold a dance in the cockpit of a cat boat. And what's a, a Sharpie? Uh, they're, they're sort of native to North Carolina, Sharpies? Is yeah, that? they're a very shallow draft boat. and uh, uh, They were New England boats, but also in North Carolina. They had their, their here in, around Beaufort. They, they use the, the Sharpies are very shallow draft. And uh, uh, shallow draft, and the, uh, when I say shallow draft, I mean the uh, rudders were like uh, uh, very long and narrow. They had to go in very shallow water. Okay, so now you've built a, a, a house and you've built a sailboat, and I don't know where the interest came unless it was from your son, my cousin Michael, uh, started playing bluegrass music and played the banjo. Is that right? Yeah, the, the guy across the street uh, from us at that time uh, had a banjo and he could sing good and so Michael went over and sat on the stoop with him a little while and next thing I knew he, Mike came to me and said he'd like to have a banjo and so things developed from there and uh, he, he eventually um, Michael maybe his second banjo was the Kyle Creed is that right Kyle Creed uh, we bought him a cheap banjo, and that didn't last but about a month and a half because uh, he could uh, he could pick very well. And he also uh, fell in with a bunch of nice people at that time who worked during the day, but they all loved music. And Washington at that time was a hotbed of bluegrass. And so, Michael, uh, we were fortunate enough to find... Uh, uh, a fellow who picked the best ben banjo I've ever heard, and bar none. And he, he was really good, but he never got the credit that he was due. But we were lucky enough to get Michael to him, and he listened to Mike, and so he took Michael as a student for a couple of years. He didn't keep students very long, and he didn't keep anyone to didn't show promise, could pick. He couldn't stand anybody that were, that were trying and didn't make it. You either did it and stayed with him or you went someplace else. And that and that led to the Kyle Creed banjo, which that was Michael's second banjo, is that correct? Uh, actually, it was a third. We had the first one, which we bought, was just a reasonable price, and then we... Uh, about a, the second banjo, which somebody had that couldn't play, but they heard Michael, and uh, we call that the Bill Wallace banjo. And when Michael had that, I wanted to get him a better one. I heard that the best uh, banjo maker up around Galax at that time was Kyle Creed. So we drove to Galax. It's fun times for Betty Jane and I. We drove up to Galax and walked down the street and there was a music store. We walked in. We said, who's the best banjo picker in the county? Since we were in Galax, they said, Kyle Creed. And we said, how do we get there? So we went to his house, and he invited us in, and we contracted for a Kyle Creed banjo, which we have now. And, and outside of knowing you and Michael, I know of Kyle Creed banjos, so they have made penetrance um so that was the kyle creed banjo and then that led it was the next banjo the one that you built yes yes and we still have that too 
And so that was the was that the first instrument that you really that you have memory of putting together a building? Yeah, because uh, we had contacts and uh, we were sailing. We 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 always hung out at the Washington Sailing Marina on weekends and holidays, and we were always hanging around people with sailboats and. <laughs> We call them sail bumps, people that were unhappy with marriage and love and whatever, and they'd go down and hang around on the Washington Sailor Marina on Sunday mornings, and, and they were going to give us an award for being the only family <laughs> that was around there. <laughs> but um, so I decided that um, after the Kyle Creed that I would get a piece of wood and make my own band. Well, make Michael's own banjo, which I did, and uh, which he has now. And how long did that project take? Uh, well, that went on for a few years. He played the Kyle Creed for a long time, and then uh, found you know I walked down to the basement, which is where I had my wood shop, and I needed to build something. So I talked to the guy at the Smithsonian. I said, "Guy," but at any rate. I talked to a good friend at the Smithsonian, and he had a, let's put it this way, he had access to get into the Smithsonian, and he had moved the big locomotive down in the Natural Museum. So he was always interested in Michael picking the Kyle Creed. And I told him uh, it would be nice for this and that, and I would like to, since I, the boat was in the water then, the cat boat was in the water, and he said, uh, well, he said, we have some fine instruments in the Smithsonian. And he says, the guys I work with also uh, keep the, those instruments in repair. And they have access to a lot of good wood. And he says, uh, we're hauling in some beams from an old house and there's a couple of pieces of cherry. You need to look at it. So I looked at the cherry and one thing led to another. And that's where the... Uh, I started out with the neck of the banjo because on the neck of that banjo, which is a little different, it has some tuners. Yeah, not my idea, but I had seen some, and these were not tuners that you twist. These were tuners with levers on them, and you could buy store-bought, we call them store-bought tuners, but we made our tuners out of brass. We cut them and put levers on them, and... Uh, I think Michael was one of the few people that could play the banjo with the tuners because it did some pretty interesting things. Good sounds. So there, there, that was one of the first instruments, if not the first instrument you built. And then you retire from, for the first time, I should say, you retire and you yeah. moved to North Carolina. Yeah, came down, hung around with the boats. My brothers were all fishermen, and, and all my friends down here were fishermen. So, uh, and so, and, and very shortly thereafter, you wind up in Beaufort. You were over Atlantic Beach for a short period of time, and then you're yeah. There was we, my, I had two brothers. We had three cottages along there. One, two, three, and so uh, Betty Jane was, although she was a Hampton, Virginia girl, used to the water. And her daddy had a Hampton One sailboat, which was first class in Virginia, built by Serio. I met him, by the way, the Hampton One class. Had running backstays on it. So at uh, any rate, she was not fond of beach life. She liked town life, snug houses. So we came to Beaufort quite often. And uh, we, this house we're sitting in now, we bought 40, about 43 years ago. And uh, somewhere along in there, you um, started building dulcimers. Yeah, that was, yeah. Well, actually, I built some skiffs, and then one thing led to another, and uh, then I built a bunch of dulcimers. So, so the, and then the, dul the dulcimers, uh, you want to tell the story about how you transitioned from dulcimers to violins? <laughs> well, you may, I don't know whether you want to hear this or not because your wonderful wife uh, and my niece by marriage, Benny, I, I told her that my brothers were a very competitive family, all boys, 
and that's the way things were if you grew up during the depression you competed for everything but anyway my one brother uh they they had big boats and they were fishing offshore in fact they uh, there's a plaque, two plaques, three plaques on the pavilion in Moorhead City with their boat names and theirs because they basically were instrumental in developing offshore charter fishing in Moorhead City. And so, uh, but at any rate, they found I was building a skiff and that uh, that was good. So my second brother, Jimmy, came over and barred the mold that I'd made for the skiff because he had a wonderful shop and a boat shop. Built a 50-foot boat in there. But at any rate, you we know, 40 plus. Uh, so he built a few skiffs and I decided I wasn't going to build skiffs anymore. Uh, so uh, that just Dol dulcimers and since we were hanging around with music and I was picking with Michael and Dennis the oldest boy played you know, he still plays bass I think he's <laughs> he's he's been retired and his his band is funny by the way uh, the makeup and um and Michael was was picking banjos so I built boys were away and Betty Jane were by herself so I just started building dulcimers and that's when James, my brothers, decided they would build dulcimers. <laughs> and so <laughs> they never could cut a scroll, though. I'm just, I'm just saying this is where it was. And so uh, I decided I was, in fact, I was in the car with you one time. I complained about my brother stealing my dulcimer design and everything. And they were doing all kinds of research at the library and everything. And Benny, your wife, said, why don't you build a violin and see if you can do that, if you can steal that. So I built the violin, and, and nobody ever uh, tried to build a violin, but they did get me to uh, repair some. That uh, that reminds me, or as, it is as if your brothers saw Bobby driving to Raleigh and said, you know, I think I'd like to go to Raleigh. So they start driving to Raleigh, and Benny goes, well, why don't you build a spaceship and go to the moon? <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that's kind of what happened with the violins. And we now arrive at where we were going, and that is violins. And um, so one of the uh, things I want to ask you about is like, okay, you decide to build a violin, and you've developed a lot of skills. And um, so where did you get, the materials for a violin did you go to the hardware store did you go uh to where they sell lumber in town and get some nice mahogany what did you do to get violin parts and how did you know what to get uh, well first of all i made a wonderful friend and the people um were living in beaufort and some folks drove up the house next door to us sales right next to town hall and um we thought we'd be good neighbors, and we went over and suggested that uh, there was a wonderful place that we liked it, and it had a the house was bigger than ours. But it turned out that uh, uh, they were in the textile business, and um, one thing led to another, and they put a contract on the house. They were third contract, and they got the house. And so we kind of became friends because we were doing our house then, and they provided the textiles for the old furniture, which we have, I say old, it was about a hundred and some odd years old, that came with the house. And so all the textiles in there are one-off design because uh, the company that his family uh, owned more or less, more I think, uh, did all the uh, tapestry for, in the country, I think. But anyway, they had two, I think, two plants, one up north and one, uh, I think, in Valdez, North Carolina. That was long ago. We're talking 40 years ago. So at any rate, uh, it turns out he was a violin player, uh, but he, 
he, he never got a chance to go on stage or anything, but he had a fantastic ear, and he knew that I played guitar, messed around on I never played very good. In fact, the kids wouldn't let me um, do anything except stand in the background and play rhythm. That was okay, because I could build stuff. But at any rate, uh, he, he said, when he was looking at the adults, he said, Bob, why don't you build a violin? And at that time, that was before I was riding with you, and Benny said, why don't you, <laughs> since it was a uh, brotherly co competition, Benny said, why don't you build a violin and see if they can build a violin? So anyway, I mentioned to Don out on the sidewalk in front of the house, his house next door to me. He, he took a credit card out and said, Bob, please build a violin and take the credit card and don't, buy any cheap wood, buy a good wood. So I did, I drove to Baltimore, I found out where the supply house was. It was the only one I ever, I found. It's one in Alabama, I drove down there, then I drove to Baltimore, and at Baltimore I ran into the manager. <laughs> there was only four people working there, the owner, uh, the manager, <laughs> a packer, and a lady that kept the books. And uh, since he was a mandolin picker, uh, we went in the back and I got a real good dissertation on woods to buy for violins because they provided it all over the country. And so uh, he took a cardboard box and he took all the stuff that I needed to uh, build a violin. So I built a violin. Now, do you know where that initial wood came from? Because early on you got some from Germany, but... Well, where they got the reason, uh, the, first of all, Baltimore's obvious was a port. And the woods that they bought, uh, I think most of it came from Bosnia. And in Bosnia, the family, the father, the head of the house would, would go out and cut the spruce, bring it in, make it into splits, and uh, put it back to season. Then they would take it to market, and the buyer was generally from Germany, the buyer that I got my wood from. He went into Bosnia, got the wood, and um, they put it on the ship, and it came into Baltimore, and that's where the uh, little warehouse was. Well, it wasn't small, but I mean, it had four people running it. So the spruce from Bosnia is what, I'm guessing what good violins are made, often made from is that? It's what all mine are made from. And uh, it, it was all graded, and that's another story. You can buy cheap wood. And price doesn't always determine the best wood when you're buying wood for a violin. So how do you determine what might be good wood for a, for a violin and what might not be? Uh, I relied on the young fellow that ran the warehouse because he picked mandolin, and uh, that's where I learned. I didn't get that from a book. And first of all, uh, I don't want to tell too much because people be flocking into the place, and but I'm not building any stuff now. But first of all, he had a wet sponge, not wet but damp, and he would pull out the splits, and we'd check the grain. And uh, there's some other things that we would do. Uh, not really, I don't think it's really necessary to talk about but how you pick the wood. And the price is not what determines the quality of wood. And it's a calculated guess on your part to part with your money and how it's going to turn out because you never know until you finish it and you scrape a bow across it and it seasons for a little while then you'll find out whether or not you made a good choice yeah th that's the first thing is you can do a really good job of picking nice wood and nice parts and do a really good job of putting them together but it doesn't ensure that you're going to have something that sounds wonderful is that right well yeah and you need somebody that can has a good ear it may not be on the stage but you need somebody that has really a good ear. And I was fortunate to uh, run into two people. Uh, one is the young fellow that helped me with the wood and number and parts. Uh, 
because remember, violin, mostly uh, they're put together by hand, but you don't cut all the parts, but you do fit all the parts, like the pegs that go in. It's, you, you buy the pegs, but you gotta shape them and do some other things, and the fingerboards, uh, uh, and the bridge, bridge, those things. So uh, you can buy expensive, you can buy cheap, and the tuners. But the main thing is, uh, the, the wood, you, you don't know what's going to happen to uh, put the heart of the violin. The heart of the violin is that little sound post that goes up in there. And the old way I feel about it is you can build a violin. And we're talking about a lot of time. I'm talking about a lot of time sitting there cutting, trimming. And the difference on the violin and the guitar is on a violin, you've got to tune the back to the belly. Uh, you might talk about what that means to tune the back to the belly. The uh, the belly is the top of the violin. Yeah, yeah, and the back is the back, and it's more like a, a body that's got the shoulders and it's got the chin and it's got the head and, uh, and you know, the, so, the ears, got ears on it. And, so it's comparable to the body. So how do you tune the belly to the back? Well, I don't tell everything because it's like finding a fishing hole. You're not going to tell everybody where it is or how you find it. And it's not, it's just that um, some things I have a closet in my mind that um, if, the re I'm not being selfish about it, but I think if a person is going to go that far, you need to go out and find the fishing hole by yourself, or you need to find out about tuning the back to the belly. And uh, there are a number of different ways. There are electronic devices now, and different people have different things. And I have some secrets that deal with salt water. Uh, let's see, and I'll give you some clues. The salt water, and I will just give you a clue. Uh, one of the things with violins is they dry out over a period of time. That's the reason the old violins sound good. They dry out. But if they get too dry, they break. Let's just suppose, let's just suppose that you uh, somehow or another figured out how to get permeate the uh, violin wood, certain parts with salt. When you put it together, it's gonna pick up some moisture. And there are those people that think that you can't build a violin on the coast. I have a different idea, and that is you build it in this uh, high humidity, salt air, and some other ways to get the wood to, uh, yeah, you're getting my secrets here. And so, uh, at any rate, I'm just telling you some things that you got to figure out how to do it yourself, because I spent a lot of time doing that. So when you apply these these techniques, many that I'm guessing you developed yourself, then you, what you're trying to do is get the back and the belly to sing together. Is that is that kind of what they're doing? No. <laughs> I don't. I have to be very blunt. You can't get the back to sing with the belly because if you do, you got a problem because then when you hit C, if the back is, it resonates at C and the belly resonates at C, you get a heart, you get a big C, you go along A, B, C, D, and then it goes, it comes down. So you've got to have a certain amount of difference between the back and belly. And what makes, what separates the boys, you can't use that expression anymore, but what separates some people from other people, is that okay? I think you can say that. Okay. Uh, what separates some people from other people is, um, figuring out how to get those two voices to be okay but not be the same. You've got to have a, a bass and you've got to have a, a tenor. Okay, and so instead of singing everybody's, the back and the belly singing a melody, are they singing a harmony? Is that closer to what's going on? Yes, and okay. you, you aren't going to get two tenors singing together. You're going to have a tenor and a bass or an alto or whatever. So you've got to have a certain amount of difference, and that's that's pretty interesting. And you get that with chisels, 
and some other things and that uh, anyone that's really interested can go out and get two pieces of wood and the pocket knife and they can find out how to do that. And that's not like a guitar or a dulcimer. Although some of the guitar makers are now saying that they are tuned the back. No, I don't think so. The violin is a notch above guitar makers, I believe. But well, that's just a prejudice and biased opinion. Well, as a longtime guitar player, I would agree with you. And and but what's interesting here to me is that uh, I know that you would tune these instruments, uh, the back and the belly, or you might say the top and the back. That might be easier for people yeah. to relate to. You do this by removing wood by hand. Is that right? Yes, with finger planes, uh, chisels. Uh, scrapers and the other thing that I had an advantage on for uh, what 20 or 30 years that my next door neighbor a good neighbor and friend who gave me his credit card to start all this business has fantastic ear and so he would he spent a lot of time with me uh, during the winter time in particular we'd have a fire in the fireplace he'd come over and uh I knew he was busy, but it, when I was tuning the back to the belly, the top to the back, his ear was much better than mine. But I had some other ways that I used, but I liked his ear better. And uh, he, uh, I don't think there's such a thing as perfect pitch, but he was be able, he could come down one day and I would tune say the top because I was tuning to a specific uh, let's say to a specific point mm -hmm. and he could say it's out a little bit you better take off a little bit more wood and you got to be careful when you take off the wood because if you take off too much you've destroyed and that's when some of the more expensive violins uh, I ran into a couple of people and they said the violins don't sound rich and what it is they they shave their back or the belly as a case they didn't stop in time so the hard thing to do is is to if you're going around a curve to know when to stop but you're in a race and you got to get around fast so the main thing is is to stop before you turn over but beat the other guy around the curve. Does that make sense? It does. You don't want to over-prepare. Uh, if, you, if you take too much off, you can't put it back on. It's about That's right. that simple. And if you don't take off enough, it doesn't uh, resonate correctly. So it's a, a judgment decision that you don't use on other instruments, I think. I think that's exactly right, and the and the person you I think you're referring to is Don Silver, and that's one of the things that strikes me about this journey that you've had with musical instruments and art in your life is that you have run across some of the most wonderful people, and I, I know quite a few of them, and they're just they're just they're just really wonderful. So, and Don's one of them. Don Silver is one of them. The uh, other thing about Don is he has a, a violin that. Uh, some universities would like to have. It's very old, probably it's English, and that kind of is, since it's not Italian, then it can't be good because it's English. However, it, uh, he had a choice back, Don, I think, is 89 now. Yeah, you know, he's a year, year or two younger than me, and we're both, <laughs> we still talk, and he's still plays the violin he's, but he's reached a point where he has to have hearing aid for one ear but his, his, he can feel vibrations and he's, he's one of the two people I know that uh, really have good ears and, and can tell you where to go and I was very fortunate to have him and so we've been friends for a long time now, you might want to mention, you sort of brushed against this, but we glossed it over, so we'll go back and talk about sound posts. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> this, this is interesting because you never hear people talk about this much, but uh, I, I've mentioned this a couple of times. I used to talk to kids. In fact, I talked to some people at Duke and about violin making and whatever, but you... Um, 
you build a violin, you put the wood together, the back and the belly, you put the neck on it, carve the scroll, put some wires on there so you can tune it up. And then the back and the belly, we talked about the tuning. The What you've done is you've got a body then, okay? We're going back to the, the body thing. So you've got a body. It's got shoulders, it's got a back, it's got a belly, it's got a chin, it's got ears, and you use that nomenclature on a violin. So you've got a body. You've built it. You spent maybe three months. It takes a lot of time because I'm very slow. Meticulous, some people said, I don't believe that. I think I'm pretty fast. However, <laughs> it has no heart. So when you put that one little peg in there, the sound post, it's the key to the whole thing. So you've got your name on the inside, the date it was built, you've got the wood, and the violin maker has put his heart and soul in there if he's really, uh, and he's, it's some boring times too, and then there's exciting times, but you put the sound post in there. To me, that's the heart. So then you've got the complete body. And so then you get somebody like Don Silver and you tune that thing up. He tunes it because he tunes it to his ear. And he takes a bow and he runs, does a scale because he's classical violin. He's not a fiddle player. He's a violinist. He just doesn't know it. They never got on the stage, but he's got the ear, and he's he gets the sound out of the violin. It'll get right into your heart and your brain, the hair on the back of your neck. And he takes a, it is worth the three months of sitting in a, a snug uh, shop with fireplace going and tuning woods and putting things together. And he runs a bow across that, uh, the strings on that violin. He does a G, he goes from G and D and A, and he gets to the E. And say, do that again, Don. Try that, try that G string, and let's see what's happening there. And you sit there, and it's a very, I'm going to use a word that, it's a delicious time. It's like uh, getting to the bottom of a ice cream cone when you get the cone, and uh, you know. So that's what I'm talking about. The sound post. And he says, Bob, the, the, the C string. I mean, that G string is a little uh, is overpowering the. Uh, I'm not going to name the strings, but that string is overpowering that string because maybe we can you move that a little bit. So that's my job. And so I would move that, and then we would get the soul of the violin would come right out into the air. And it's the heart of the violin is that sound pig. And it, you don't, the, the player gets the soul out. That's what Don does. That's the way I feel about it. Uh, Don's been playing since he was a child. Is that right? Didn't yes. Start? And yes. I, one of the things that I'm familiar with is it takes 10,000 hours, just the average person. If they took 10,000 hours, you could become a virtuoso at something. And Don's probably one of those people that has spent 10,000 hours with a violin in his hands. He sounds like that to me. Um, but I will ask you this about the sound post. So you have the body together, the back onto the top. You've got a box. You've got a body. And you place the sound post. That's when the sound post goes into the violin. Is that right? Yes. So um, you want to talk about that or how you do Not that? Not too much about the sound post because uh, uh, it, it goes under the leg. See, um, you've got a lot of tension on the bridge. And the, one of the legs of the bridge is uh, sits on the sound post. Not on it, but a certain distance, which we don't talk about too much, because that, that comes from judgment. You know, good judgment, bad judgment. And sometimes you can change that a little bit. And so uh, it, the, the sound post sits under the uh, 
the tenor part, the high part, the E string, and the A string. And that sound post sits there in the G strings. So what it does, it uh, keeps the, it, it, it transmits the, the, the A string and the E string into the, the back. And that's from the belly to the back. And so that basically the sound post, if it's done right, will not let the G strings, the lower strings overpower the higher or the tenor strings if you're just talking. So you must get this in there by drilling a hole in the violin and shoving it in there. Is that how that works? Uh, not exactly. <laughs> there's, there's no way in the world, and everybody has a different way. It's a special little tool. It's just a piece of steel that's got, looks like a uh, S that's been flattened out, and it's got a blade on either end. And the standard way is to uh, to impale that little dowel, looks like a piece of a sucker stick, if anybody ever had penny suckers, only it's bigger, a little dowel. And you take that, but it has to be fitted to the back and the belly. And that fitting is pretty important too. And there's some things and ways to get that done and some tricks. And these are things that you work out over a period of time. I could tell someone how to do it, but it wouldn't be any fun for them. It's best if they find the fishing hole themselves and they can figure out how to shape the foot, it'd be the foot and the head of that uh, that little uh, heart, so not, well, the heart of the violin, that sound, po sound post. So, at any rate. So you, ha you have this tool that you can attach well, now out. there's some different ways, and uh, uh, you can, uh, the, but the standard way is if you take it to a violin shop, they're going to impale the sound post on one of these things, turn it, and slip it into the uh, F hole, twist it, and get it up, and then uh, they each person has its own way of getting it into the right position and you got to move it back and forth and sometimes you want to move it back and forth but if it's not set just right then you aren't going to get a balanced sound and sometimes you can never set one and then the violin doesn't work good so it's not as good as the other violin sitting on the shelf next to it so now you just mentioned f holes can you tell the listeners what the f holes are yeah well you, the uh, the back in the belly of the uh the, the violin is like an air pump, more or less, and they vibrate at different resonances. And so the uh, sound post does its job of not only carrying the uh, sound from the back to the belly, but also keeping the thing from collapsing. And so where it sits has a lot to do with how good a voice the violin has. So does that F make sense? Yeah, and the F holes, you they're in the belly or the top of the violin. You have two holes. They're more really more like slots than holes, aren't they? Yeah, and um, there's, there's a lot of mystique attached to the F holes. You got strad holes and you got the mates and you make your own. And um, the other thing is you're pumping air or sound. I'm not sure, but when that back vibrates with the belly and the air comes out the F holes, it must, but it's a very minute amount, but the sound comes out too. Okay. I've never taped up the F holes. I'll do that sometimes to see what happens. But in the meantime, F holes are very important and they have a lot of mystique attached to where and how. And if you look at those F holes, they have notches. There'll be two little notches. It's like an F with a curl at the end and it has two notches on it. And I've seen so many violin players and people don't know what those little notches are for. Those notches should line up with the feet of the bridge. And so, so it's a good way to know where to set the bridge. The bridge is what holds the strings up like a suspension bridge. You got the, I will call them the wires that go over it. And those feet go to the belly of the violin and under the foot of the, I'm going to say the tenor string so people understand it, is the uh, 
is a soundpost, but it's not under the foot, and the distance from the soundpost to the foot of the bridge is very important. And I'm talking about the thwart ship or fore and aft if you hang around boats, up and down, sideways, whatever. So do you tune violins with the position of the sound post as well? Do you move it to change the sound of the violin? It does, and it changes the balance of the sound by uh, not having one the bass overpower the soprano and break her neck. So that that must be pretty easy to uh, to, to measure the distance from the back to the to the belly by reaching through the to the f holes, the sound holes, and trying to figure out how long this sound post is going to be. Is that easy or is that not so easy? No. <laughs> it's a very simple post, but fitting it and moving it and uh, setting it where you think it'll do the best is very difficult, time-consuming, because every time you change it, you don't know whether you've moved it t to benefit the violin or not. And not only that, you move it fore and aft, and you move the top of the sound post fore, aft, and sideways, and the bottom post. And I don't know how, it's an infinite number of, of uh, positions for the sound post. And that's where my good friend Don came in. So when you sort of uh, uh, completed construction, let's just say it that way, then you and Don would get together and you would start tuning these violins. Is that what you would do? Well, well, no, uh, yeah, they were the tuners. We played them then. When you get the sound post in, and sometimes we spend a couple of days moving that sound post around because Don could remember. I never could, but Don could remember whether we improved it or we made it worse, you know, whether it was good or bad. And so uh, his ear was essential for me to... Uh, to move the sound post. So you would move it, and he would make a suggestion, and you would try that, and you'd, he'd play it yeah. again. You'd listen to it. And and, and the bridge. Now you're moving the foot of the bridge and the sound post and the strings. And what I, you're talking about boring, and you just give, I just give up and walk out. But what we would do is um, Don would have to detune each time because we had to take the tension off the string so we could move the sound post and the bridge. And then he could detune, that is loosen up those strings, and then I would move the sound post. Then he would tighten them up the strings and retune the violin. I think he could retune a violin in eight hours. I think he could do it uh, probably uh, I, I, I'm just guessing here. I'm saying 60 minutes. So he could do all this in five minutes. It'd take me an hour. So he would loose the strings. We'd move the bridge or move the foot of the sound post or the other, and we'd move the bridge fore and aft. But remember, all of it, so you'll know, you know, if you could have a journey. you got to know where you start. you got to know where you're going to. And if you stop along the way, you've got to know where you stopped. And if you don't, you're in trouble. So moving that sound post and moving the bridge, you had to know when you were going ahead or whether you're moving back or whether you're right where you were when you started. And so Don was essential to me, and I, I, I just don't know how I could ever thank him for uh, helping me set the sound post and the bridge, the feet of the bridge, and we're talking about a very, very small amount of movement. Very, so very small. Those were the two primary ingredients uh, or variables you had to control was the position of the sound post and the position of the bridge. Is that? I like that word you just used. It's an infinite number of variables on a violin that uh, separate set from some other instruments. And uh, it takes somebody with a good ear to do it. Otherwise, uh, if you just setting a student violin on a standard music shop, you just put it in a certain spot. But if you can really get somebody that's critical, you, you need a good ear. So Don would, you would start, and he you would, I, I'm guessing in the beginning you could make bigger adjustments as you, until you started 
getting close. Is that how that would work? Is that when you made a move, Don would tell me whether it was good or bad. And that's how you sort of figured it out. And would Don play like a tune, a few bars? Would he play for five minutes and say, oh, this is really beginning to sound? How, how did that work? I never could control it. <laughs> he had his own mind. <laughs> I would move the sound post or maybe the bridge. You don't move both at the same time. If you do both at the same time, you don't know what. So you'd move the foot of the bridge, the top, the bottom. You got one, two, three, four different positions. So uh, you would move only one position, and then. But he would start playing, and he wasn't quite sure, and I couldn't stop him. So I had to sit in there and wait for him to, to go through a whole. I wouldn't call it a melody, but he wasn't going to just uh, do a scale. Mm -hmm. he, all of a sudden, he'd start enjoying it, that thing, and he'd sit there, and I, he thought he was on a stage in Carnegie Hall or somewhere, <laughs> and he wouldn't stop playing, and I wasn't sure, so I had to be patient, but he was patient with me, too. It's so like, it, I'm guessing that once it started sounding good to Don, then he really would play it for a while. <laughs> for one thing, you really do have to have a lot of feedback from the instrument. You know, what's it really, what is it really saying? That, oh, yeah. It was he, it, it, it was talking to him. When it was talking to him good and being nice, then he, wasn't, he was going to let it stop talking because then he started enjoying it. Yeah. And so I had to sit while, the, the, but I enjoyed it too because I, I, could, uh, I got to the point that I could tell when the violin was speaking well. I, you know, speaking, I mean talking to me, uh, and I, I don't, know how but it's if you hang around and just keep listening pretty soon you develop a a certain sense like fishermen know when a, f a fish is on the line other people don't that's that experience of well it is experience once you've done something repeatedly for a long period of time you know what to expect yeah and we, we and when we have no experience we can't be very good at that but as the time begins to add up even if we're a novice, we we pretty quickly began to know what to expect, and I think that's probably yes. part of being a virtuoso is developing those things. You, you just took what I said and said it very well, so that it can be understood. Yes. Well, tell me this then. Tell me about scrolls. Oh, well, uh, scrolls. Uh, first off. <laughs> Scrolls are, uh, there's no two scrolls that are hand cut that are alike. And a scroll is not a piece of parchment. This what? Not a piece of parchment. It's not a roll of paper. Oh, no. It's the, we should uh, tell people what the, the scroll top, is. It's a little curly Q thing on the top of a violin. And I forgot what that curve is. But the way you get that uh, curve for the scroll, if you take a pencil, you drive a nail on a board, take a pencil and put a, string around it and wind it up and as you as you take the pencil and drag it around on the board you'll get the shape of a scroll and each time you you go around it unwinds and it goes out that's how you get the scroll the shape of it but then it's a you you got depth let's say we got depth and you've got shape and uh the you got two parts to it and if you take a scroll look at the neck of a violin hold it up to the light and see if the uh, ears that's those little things at the end of the scroll see if they match each other perfectly if they do it's probably machine cut if it isn't it's probably hand cut and if it's hand cut it's nearly impossible and the best way to cut a scroll is to get another scroll and take a pocket knife and some chisels or whatever you want to make in the shop and start carving. And so uh, and you, you, and you cut you cut away everything that doesn't look like a scroll. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, and it's, it's kind of tricky, and particularly on a violin. The viola is a little bit easier, and I like cellos. They're really fun. I like to cut a scroll because after doing a violin, a cello is so big and, you know, it's... Uh, Okay, so we should say, and I'm going to put some pictures. There'll be links to pictures uh, on the site, or there'll be pictures on the site of uh, 
some of Uncle Bobby's, at least one of his violins and some of his instruments so that you can identify some things we're talking about. But the neck comes out of the body, and then do you, do you carve the neck first and the scroll last? How does that How? how no, I, uh, you do the uh, body first, the uh, back and the belly, and you tune them, and you glue them together, and then you... Uh, you you do the neck and the scroll, and you fit it into the uh, body. That's tricky. Then you uh, put on the fingerboard, make the bridge, and put on the chin rest and the pegs. Now, uh, I, I might mention to you sometimes, if you want to kind of check your violin, first thing I do is when I pick up a violin, I look over on the back, and I look for two little pegs. That look, generally, it's a half, a half a little black dot or a white dot, but there's a little peg in there. And when you hand make a violin, you have to keep taking the uh, back or the, the belly, and you have to keep putting it on the body, the corpse, Corpus. You have to keep putting it on and off. So therefore, I generally use, and this guy, some guy by the name of Stradivari, uh, used uh, <laughs> this black ebony wood and mine around, but he used half one and set it into the uh, purfling there, that little black stuff that goes around the edge. And so you'll find a, a black dot. And then I also take a little bit of pride at the neck, you'll find a piece of uh, ebony wood back there. And that guy by the name of Strad Stradivari, somebody, he did that too. And that that is not easy to do without messing up the whole back. So uh, if, if you're going into a shop sometime and you're looking at violins, look for those two little dots in the back, which are pegs that you can put it on and off. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, and, and for the listeners, where what Uncle Bobby was indicating is that on the back, if you if you turn the violin upside down, what we normally think upside down, at the bottom and at the top is where these two places are. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, and and is it there, the uh, position pegs so that you can keep. If you might have to keep carving off some and putting some on, you always. Taking on and not taking off too much, better to leave a little bit heavy. And my thought is, if you leave it a little bit heavy and don't go around the curve too fast and turn over, that uh, over a period of time, maybe 50 or 75 years, that wood's going to dry out, and then you will have a, a good sounding violin. But if you make it to sound perfect now and you thin the wood too much, then it doesn't, uh, you, you've gone too far, you've turned the car over, and there's blood all over the road and uh, people laying out in the street. So you don't want to go too fast and turn off the people and everything. Uh, so that's how you got into violins. And then did you make violas after violins? I know you made some violas as yeah, well. Yeah, while I was building violins, my friend Don uh, asked me to build a viola for uh, the, the music director, uh, some, uh, I'm trying to think the place in Greensboro, I can't remember it, but it was pretty well known. Uh, and, and, and the, the, the uh, violin director or teacher or head of the, uh, the instructor was a big man, so I built a big viola, and Don donated it to the uh, school there with a scholarship, and I got a call for a couple of years from kids at the uh, inherited that and uh they were i don't i think the scholarship probably ran out but that's a, that's another thing about things that we've done over our time do you have do you have an estimate of how many violins you've built not many not many i, I haven't and but also i didn't have apprentice boys to do my cutting i did it all i've never been in a hurry i'd stop and take a trip down the intercoastal and come back and do it again and summertime was not a good time to build. Best time was the fall of the year and when it was cold and I could have a fire in the fireplace. 
And violas, you made less less violas than violins. Yes, that's true. And the same way cellos. Mostly I built violins, a couple of three to cars, and a couple of banjos. That's about all I've ever built. And cellos. You you mentioned cellos, and you yeah. built a, a few of those. And um, tell me about your association with Duke and cellos. Well, uh, the guy brought me a cello. From It was an antique shop. And he brought me a cello. He says, can you do anything with this? And it was the worst-looking mess you've ever seen. It was black, solid black. And so... Uh, no, you have to use water. I use a damp sponge, but you have to use it sparingly. There's nothing wrong with using one if you're careful and don't let the water. But at any rate, so I got a damp sponge and rubbed on it a little bit, and I found a beautiful piece of wood under there. And the strings, oh, by the way, this was not a standard cello. I found out later it was called a church bass. And the, you, you want me to go tell you about the story of that? Sure. Okay, because it's pretty interesting. Um, let me start over again and say prior to the Revolutionary War, the English were selling us violins that came over on the ship, but they would not send over cellos. They took up too much space and they didn't make enough money. Those English were very clever. So it was a guy up in Connecticut who was even more clever, and he was a cabinet maker, <coughs> and he needed a cello, but all he had was a thing in his memory. They didn't have drawings and things in. So... <coughs> He made a cello, and I forgot what his name is. I got it around here somewhere. But at any rate, he uh, made that, and then later on they started bringing in cellos. So there was, so far as I know, I think there's six in the world now. He made six of them, but one of them ended up in West Virginia, and it was probably Virginia that time before it came West Virginia, and as you know, they had a lot of coal, and this, uh, they thought it was a base, and they put it up in the attic. Time went by, people died, whatever. It came out of the attic and ended up in an antique shop. Uh, the dealer brought it to me one time, and he said uh, he knew I'd done a little bit of work. And anyway, I don't repair violins. I build them. I don't, but I can, but I don't do it. So he said, can you help me out? I said, I don't know. It's a pretty interesting instrument, but it was all cracked. And it was solid, it was just solid black. And it turned out it had been up in the attic next to where all the soot from the uh, coal dust was. So I cleaned it up and it was made out of cherry. And cherry over a couple of hundred years was as hard as steel and you couldn't bend it, you couldn't do anything. So I made a mold and got a, went to the hardware store and got a bunch of screws and you know, threaded the wood, and so I was able to put some pressure on this cello, uh, both down and from the sides and from the back. And uh, he had a friend, had a, a waterfront place uh, down on the creek. It was very damp. So they put it down on the creek in the high humidity, and every day, not every day, but every once in a while, I'd go by and put a little pressure on each screw. And I was able to put it back together without tearing up the wood. After I put it together, he uh, got interested in it and did a uh, research. And uh, at that time, I was messing around with uh, Brenda niece. She's, she's married now. In fact, she's 50 now. This right many years ago. She's be coming in in a couple of three days. She comes out every year and plays a cello. We eat some soup and stuff. At any rate, I, I uh, got that thing together. And it, uh, uh, Brenda, at that time, was a curator of, of the musical instruments at Duke University. I think it was whatever. It's on the Internet. So she came down and saw it and called some guy up and some lady up in New York had a pickle. No, I shouldn't say too much there, but they had a benefactor, I think you were a benefactress, who uh, put up the money, and they bought it, and it's a duke. Now, and it turned out, the story on this, there were six of them built that they know of, and one of them is at Duke in their museum. It was a couple of three years ago, and it's got my name on it. 
And it says restore, and I told them, I don't restore, I repair. But she put it on there anyway. And she plays cello, by the way. <laughs> and she she comes to see me every year, and she sits there and plays that cello. And I've got a violin she likes called a squirrel violin. So anyway, that's the story of that uh, church bass. And uh, that's the reason I use cherry on the cellos. You know, it's interesting. Um, not only have you built a lot of instruments, it seems like a lot of instruments, and really... Uh, I should say that you've created a lot of art, but you've interested a lot of people in music. I know my family plays. I know uh, your sons play. Um, there's no, it's hard to say how much that's flowered. It would be impossible to track it all down, but a lot of people have picked up music in their life um, from you doing this and from you being interested. So thank you for that. And I'm going to loop back around and go from the beginning and say uh, we've spent a couple of episodes. Uh, Will, Faith, and Glenn talked about education a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this is a different way to be educated and educated to the point where it becomes art and you become an artist instead of just educated. So thanks for the time. We appreciate it. We'd like to come back and speak to you again about some other things, if we might, here at the Crystal Coast in Beaufort, North Carolina. Um, uh, and, and we'd like to try to get you to talk about you and Aunt Betty maybe the next time we get together. You think you'd be willing to do that? Yeah, well, it, uh, we're closer, both of us are closer to 91, so if you're coming back, don't wait too late. <laughs> and, uh, uh, no, uh, because that's a much more interesting story. I love stories, and this was not much of a story, but I think, I'm sure you got this cut off, it, but uh, Betty Jane and I have lived a story. You've lived a, a fairy tale, I think. And we should just mention as a teaser, because we'll come back and do this. How long have you uh, been married to Aunt Betty? Uh, been married 70-some years, nearly going on nearly 71. And how long have you known Aunt Betty? Um, uh, about 76. 76 But she years. put a note in my we, we figured it out this morning because you had mentioned you might come down or something. And <clears throat> we think she stuck that note in my history book uh, about 75, 76 years ago. So, and, 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 the, and the last thing we'll mention as we wrap this up is uh, you will actually be 91 in October. Is that right? Yeah, next, next month. month. Yeah, next month. Yeah. And Aunt Betty will be 91 in April, is that right? No, no, in January. January. I'm, I'm three date. months older than she is. She loves, right after my birth, after October, boy, she loves October, she loves November, December, because at that time, I'm older than she is, and that's <laughs> very important to her. <laughs> I can understand why. Uncle Bobby, thanks for sitting down with us, and we look forward to seeing you again here on the uh, the podcast, and uh, and see you soon, and, um, and, and glad to hear from you. Always good to talk to you, nephew. Well, that's our show for today. I'm Will Jarvis. And I'm Will's dad. Join us next week for more narratives. 